Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Three Ways Finance Can Create Value in an Uncertain Market. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, then we'll dig into our discussion. First, we would like to thank Workday for their partnership with today's event. They've been wonderful thought leadership partners to Argyle, and they're committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. Thank you again to Workday. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. I also wanted to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our member support of this policy. For those of you who are seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found under the polls tab on the right hand side of your console right next to chat. Afterwards, if you're eligible to receive credit, you will receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions about credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. Finally, and most importantly, please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Let's begin our discussion. Scott, over to you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you everyone for joining today. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Scott Moyer. I'll introduce myself and the panel in just a minute, but before we do that, we actually want to get to know our audience today. So if you will, we're going to start with a couple of polling questions. So are you, what's your current function? Finance, procurement, HR, slash payroll, IT, are you an executive? And we have the, if you check the polls tab on the right there, you'll see we've got a pretty fair distribution almost in the 20 to 30 percent across the board. Excellent. Thank you for that. And then our next question is going to be around what level are you? So we've got um, that question C level, VP, director, senior director. So similar kind of distribution across both. Thank you for that. Let's get, let's move on to our introductions. My name is Scott Moyer. I am a solutions director for Workday here in the office of the CFO, former CFO of uh, five companies. I've been in and around finance and accounting for the last 30 years. I've sold to CFOs. I've, I've been one. I've got a lot of passion around the topic today, which is three ways finance can create value in an uncertain market. And I'm going to ask my uh, participants here to introduce themselves. Themselves. We're going to start with Juliet. Juliet, give us a quick intro on you. Hi, everyone. I'm Juliet Grabowski. I'm a managing director and partner at the Boston Consulting Group, and I co-lead globally our Center for Finance Function Excellence. So I spend pretty much all of my time with CFOs and their teams, helping them to drive to the next level of efficiency and effectiveness and to bring their finance function into the future. Helen? Hello, everyone. Greetings from the winter wonderland. I'm Helen Yu, the founder and CEO of Taigong Advisory. Uh, Taigong Advisory is a, a value creation accelerator providing CXO, uh, fractional CXO services to companies of all sizes. I actually started my career as a financial analyst and accountant, uh, designed uh, hundreds of financial planning applications, working with the CFOs at global enterprises and pivoted from a bean counter to a bean grower. I'm extremely excited about being here with you today. Thank you. I love that bean counter to bean grower. We're going to talk about that value creation side in just a minute, but let's round this up with uh, someone who's actually a practitioning CFO and that's Kathy. If you would just, Kathy, give us your sure, background. Great. And Thank you, from. Scott. Uh, um, Kathy Donzilla. I have been in a variety of finance roles over the course of my 35 plus years. So I've got you beat there, Scott, just a little bit. Um, most recently, <laughs> Chief Financial Officer uh, at New Res, uh, non-bank, one of the top five, I guess, non-bank mortgage originators and servicers. Uh, I'm actually in transition uh, and will be starting a new and exciting role starting on Monday, this coming Monday, again, in the financial services space. Uh, and I think that Scott's passion is for finance and finance transformation uh, may outstrip mine, but if it does, Scott, it's really only by just a little bit. Uh, it's been something that I have made as kind of a, a North Star of my time 
in finance. Awesome. So our topic is creating value in an uncertain world. And we're going to talk about the three areas, the three things you can do to, to create that value. What do we mean by value? We're talking, of course, about shareholder value, uh, profitability uh, in excess of your cost of capital. So you have to do better than your cost of capital, which is an important point, especially in our current environment of interest rates, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is really ask um, uh, uh, Juliet to kind of walk us through these three areas and then we're going to take the screens down and you'll see our faces and we'll be addressing each of the three areas in more detail one at a time. But for a beginning intro to the topic, I'm going to hand it back over to Juliet and let you give us some some pointers on each of the three of these, starting with this one. Sure. Um, and maybe first I'll just start by saying something about the world that we live today in today. And there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of volatility. And that continues to be true. You know, I was, I was reflecting this morning about how we live in a world where a meme can cause a stock to skyrocket. A few tweets can lead to a bank run. You know, we're living in a more interconnected world than ever before. And so what does that mean for finance functions? What I'm observing as I'm talking to finance leaders is more than ever, they need to change the way that they do work to be not only responsive, but proactive to what's happening in the environment. So how are they doing this? And there are three things that we wanted to highlight. So insights, adaptability, and talent. So let's start with insights for just a moment. I, I loved Helen's point about moving from being a bean counter to a bean grower. I, you like that too, Scott. I feel like I'm gonna start using that, but this is really, when we say insight, it's really about moving from this kind of bookkeeper role to more active value generator. So finance functions more and more have to be bringing that unique insight into the business, not only what happened, but why, and what do we do about it? And what is the impact of that? In order to bring more insight, one has to be more responsive and adaptive. So getting to the point about being more adaptable, this is really about bringing data together in new ways. And it's actually a really exciting time in finance right now with finance being able to put its hands on more and different types of data and connect things like operational drivers to financial outcomes in new ways that allows the finance function and the business to have greater foresight into what's going to happen, but then also being able to react very, very quickly. Okay, I see this in the marketplace. Therefore, if I take this action, what does that mean for us? That kind of adaptability and responsiveness is so critical and helps to make finance really the hero for the business is when you can bring that kind of insight in a very quick and responsive way. But how do you do that? Like certainly you need new data and capabilities, um, functionally speaking, but you also need new skills and talent, which is the last piece. And if I'm being honest, I haven't talked to a CFO who's who said, you know, I'm not worried about talent at all. That's not the conversation, right? It's very much, we need new skills. We need new capabilities. We need finance leaders who are good at the strategic advisory and know how to work with data and know how to work in new platforms in different ways and to be very agile. Like all these new skills are so critical. Um, in addition to having to rethink new roles in the finance function, bringing in data scientists, for example, or folks who know how to configure and a plan or whatever it might be. And so the talent model I'd say is really evolving within finance in a way that's very exciting. And so I think the, the finance leaders that I've seen in the finance functions that I see that are really moving into the future are being very thoughtful about each of these things, bringing the insight, being very responsive and adaptive, and also very thoughtful about the talent model and getting the right people in place to drive business outcomes. So really excited to have a conversation on, on each of these three imperatives. Great, let's get right into it then. So um, I, I wanna start the conversation with Kathy because you are the, the, the current CFO in the room. Um, and you know when we think about insights, it's all about you know, what, where, where do insights come from? They come from information. Where does information come from? It comes from your data. So when you talk about insights, you really have to get into to data and you have to ask the question, you know, what is the lens that I'm really driving towards in those, these insights? At the end of the day, if you're a CFO, your job is shareholder value. Your job is to grow profitably. And 
And you've got to be able to understand at the most granular level how to do that. So what I thought we would start with is, as you think, Kathy, about your transformation and some of the work you've done with your finance transformation at New Res, talk to us a little bit about the data and kind of some of the insights that you you are now able to get after your transformation that maybe you weren't able to prior to that. Uh, sure, Scott. Um, you know, I think that what I always try and would encourage everyone to do first off is start with what, um, and what you need to understand is what are the drivers. So what I'm going to describe are going to be some things that have been very impactful and meaningful for us uh, in our business. Um, and those could be completely transferable to any other organization because they're just the belts and suspenders, right? But there could be interesting and very nuanced what's that are different. So everybody should at least step back and pause and sort of think about what, right, is where you start. Um, but one of the thing that one of the biggest drivers for us really is the individual contribution of any investment of capital that we're making. And what that means is, is we are driving down to profitability across the entire, I'll hear people say uh, wallet share, people can call it, you know, customer penetra, whatever they want to call that. But what is our comprehensive organizational um, return on any investment that we make. We have B2B channels, right, where we're buying assets that have already been manufactured effectively, or we could be producing units, which is B2C. And each one of those drives very different dynamics and has very different um, return profiles for us right? And they have different timelines to manufacture and to get through. And so I think that for us, the ability to really drive costs and revenue, attributed revenue to each one of those individual channels, uh, and then each one of those can, ag and that could be at a product level, we have it at an investor level, we have it at our, our market takeout. I guess is what I'd say. We call that an investor. So who do we sell our products to? Um, what are the products that we're selling? What are the business channels that are driving those? And then what are the segments and the way that we allocate capital from an external perspective? Um, and so we have been able not perfectly, still aspirational, right? We'll never probably get there, but we have been driving toward very granular costs allocated at that granular transactional level, including all the way up to mm -hmm. and through returns, and then calculating returns at a segment level um, and being able to aggregate that all the way up. So doing things at each business unit, channel, division, you could call them different things, we call them channels. Um, but I think that that has been a real differentiator for us to decide how to allocate our capital. So thank you for mentioning capital. A lot of a lot of folks know what profitability is and they 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 are able to do segment profitability or profitability down to certain levels, maybe even a customer PL. But but you're tying this back to equity, which means if you really want to know how you're doing, you've got to see that return on invested capital. People call it ROIC economic value, economic profit, whatever you want to call it, but you really need to have the data to be able to go granular enough to see how am I doing it. If I look at, you know, as a CFO, I'm taking the investor's money and I'm investing it in my own business in different channels, different customers. That's the, the that's the job is to maximize the efficiency of that capital. What are you able to do now that you weren't able to do previously? Can you get, you, you mentioned segment level, are you able to get like, for example, the balance sheet's often the hardest part, right? Getting the balance sheet to a level where I can. Yeah. So you know. um, part of our transformation, and again, this is where, you know, I can't really give the best advice that I can give anybody is think very carefully about your technology partners and your implementation. And again, this is always, what do you want out? What am I driving toward? Um, we made what now in hindsight is probably a genius move, um, but we actually balance on multiple dimensions, but one of them is segment. And so we have a fully allocated 
balance sheet and income statement for every one of our segments. And within even some of our segments, we have the ability to drill down at a fully allocated balance sheet and income statement um, for channels and different components of our business. Uh, and so we took it and just sort of took what would have historically been, you know, most people capture data at a legal entity level. We sort of turned it on its side and said, well, let's not do that. Let's do it at a segment level and use the hierarchies that you can build to actually aggregate segments up to legal entities. Um, that has really enabled us to have the discipline to record originating entries or to capture originating data at a segment level um, so that we are in the moment I, you know capturing data at that lowest level because that's how we measure ourselves to be honest right like that's how mm -hmm. we allocate capital um, and that gives us um, and it's fully allocated and I'm not talking um, that we have to do, we do have some high level, just sort of what I call peanut butter spread allocations of some of our corporate costs, et cetera. But these are really very direct driven capabilities where you can actually capture information down to an invoice level um, and attach it to particular transactions or particular types of activity and get that down into a segment. So the, I'd say segment, balance sheets and income statements has been one of probably the most transformative from the capability of really understanding what it takes. Now, having said that, it's also super important to not just calculate what your capital is uh, that you're using because that's math. What's been more important has been we also have the capability to, I'll use the word tag, but we can tag transactions as encumbered or unencumbered, meaning is that asset financed or is that asset available to be financed? Um, and that's a capability to be able to have that in real time because that's again an opportunity to drive better efficiency with your liquidity and your financing mm -hmm. needs, uh, but also to be smarter about levered returns and to be smarter about what's on your balance sheet that you can lever, whether you choose to lever or not, different question, different answer, right? Um, but I think that the ability now for systems to ingest massive quantities of data and actually tag or capture and attach at originating transactions, all of this kind of information, and to be able to capture it as it flows through your, I'll call it manufacturing process, even though ours is a virtual manufacturing mm -hmm. process. Um, that's the kind of desktop, just push button reporting that these new technological advances have enabled uh, is to be able to drive all of that. And you mentioned technology at, at full disclosure, you did implement Workday and you're referring to tags. We call it work tags. It's really just flexible dimensionality that you can add to be able to get down to this kind of reporting. I wanna turn it over to Helen and, and ask a question because data is really top of mind for a lot of CFOs. And it really, it, if, they're, if they haven't transformed yet, um, it can be one of their key pain points. Uh, so Helen, I thought we'd have you kind of give us an, a, your view on what are some of the big pain points that CFOs are talking about today in your world and, and, and how are you advising them? Sure, Scott. I'm, I actually have spoken with a dozen of CFOs lately. The three Ds are keeping them up, right? First one, first D is data, data quality and accuracy. So just having the data does not mean you can act on that. It's so important for finance team to understand the context of data. And so what, Cassie described that unit economic is very resonated with all the CFOs, right? The ability to, to understand the context of the data, explain what data is being delivered to their team or prospective audience critical. Second D is delivery, delivery speed. How quickly can you deliver that data and need it to make that informative business decision? The third one is data governance, right? We talk about risk management all the time. Uh, that should be top of mind for all the financial leaders. Uh, what, what data needs to be protected? 
who should have access to what data, and also what is your hedging strategy to reduce the risk overall, especially in this uncertain market. Uh, Juliet, anything you want to add to that in terms of CFO pain points, the three Ds around data and governance, what, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think um, to me, there's oftentimes a pain point around connecting it in ways that drive to insight, right? And I think like there's a big push right now as there should be to develop more driver-based methodologies. So like when we think about forecasting, you know, old school way is take last year and project forward a 3% increase, right? But getting a lot smarter around, okay, what are the things that actually drive uplift? Having good insight and tagging tagging those in the right way to be the right inputs to then inform the forecast and inform your path forward. Being able to do all that stuff end to end and connect it to actual decision making is, is the pain point slash the opportunity. Because when you get that right, it unlocks so much ability to make value added decisions. And so it's like, you've got to have good data, but then you've got to connect it in the right ways and plug it into your, your decision making processes, I'd say. And it can be overwhelming, right? And when you think about the explosion of data, I, I think of accounting as input process output, right? The, the inputs to accounting and finance, not just from inside the four walls of the company, so to speak, but external data that's now available. Um, you mentioned being able to react to things in the market. Well, you have to know what's happening and you have to be able to be connected to the outside world to know what's happening. That means external data. And that's very scary for accounting people because you can't control it. Sometimes it's, it's just out there, but you do need to have a pulse on the market. And then on the other side of the equation, the information required from stakeholders is, is ever increasing. We've got ESG requirements, all kinds of regulatory requirements uh, by industry. Uh, FASB's always got something up their sleeve that they're going to come out with that we have to respond to as accounting and finance professionals. Just I, I open this up to anyone who wants to comment on it. How, how does a, a CFO in this emerging technology world when there's so much technology out there and so much data requirements how, how do they get their arms around all of that and really focus it you know in order to drive those impactful decisions so uh, whoever wants to answer yeah julia yeah i'm happy to jump in i think it all comes down to what's the use case like what am i trying to do with it so for example if I'm trying to get my arms around how customer behavior is changing, let's say that I'm a retailer, so I have a better sense of what products do I need where, right? That's where something like the external data is really helpful in thinking, okay, well, what external data around customer behavior will help to inform that? And then pulling that in a way that then plugs into your processes around Therefore, here's what I forecast to have ha expect to happen going forward, right? Here's what kind of demand I expect. So I, it, to me, it all comes down to what question are we trying to answer in the business, which then, of course, ties to your point about a shareholder return at the end, right? Like what matters for the business? What questions do they need to answer? And therefore, what data do I plug in as opposed to thinking, OK, there's all this data out there. What could I do with it? If you're really practical about what you're trying to do with it, that can help focus, not only focus the energy, but help to drive real value quickly. We, we have a customer at Workday, I, I won't name them, but they they run a, uh, let's, let's say a oil change business, and they are able to forecast based on weather data each day, how many people to staff in each location. Now, if you think about that from a shareholder value perspective, you've got a fixed cost location in a building, right? You've got variable revenues and and variable costs many companies are not able to manage the variable cost side they, they they will schedule based on what they normally do then the weather comes and the, the, the store is shut down so they could they can in this example they can flex between one to five people in the store based on historical weather patterns artificial intelligence can tell them yet you know, we only need one person or two people in, in the store that day that's directly managing down your costs from a CFO's perspective at the micro level. Um, I love that example in particular because it is about driving that, that asset ROI on, on the stores. Any other any other thoughts on, on insights and data before we move on to yeah. our next topic? Scott, I'd like to chime in, right? I also think improving the financial literacy and cross functional collaboration can help increase understanding the data. When I was a chief customer officer at a global company, I realized that not all the leaders on my team are financial savvy, right? That's being said, we created a financial dashboard 
for workforce planning, for example, you know, when we map out all the key drivers that's relevant or the assumptions relevant for workforce planning, we are able to show people what are decision being affected if there is a, you know, based on certain data input, right? For example, what adjustment or hiring decision needs to be made or changed if customer retention rate dropped or improved or also sales performance changes. So having that visibility and automating that entire process using the system really helped the team to uh, really uh, turning that data into insights. So I think having, a, a, let's say, investing in improving people's financial literacy would really help. And I like what you said about people, you know, for most services organizations, people is their biggest cost. So having people and money data in the same system where you can immediately reconcile, you don't have to reconcile the two, it's the same system is really helpful to that. Of course, that's something Workday talks a lot about. Uh, and any other comments before we move on to the next topic? Okay, so that was insights. Let's talk about agility, adaptability. How, you know, the, the the world is changing on a regular basis. We all know this. We just went through a, a pandemic. Then we had supply chain issues. Then there's runaway inflation. Then there's interest rates, which I know is near and dear to Kathy's heart. When interest rates change, her cost of goods sold goes right up, right? And you, you in, in some cases, you have to react to that. So that this topic is about what role does technology play in allowing your organization to adapt as things change in the, in the business. In the past, you know, budget cycles would take months to prepare. And then, you know, think about if you're in the airline industry in March of 2020, you know, you just rip that budget right up because your revenues just went to zero. So how, how do companies respond when things happen out in the marketplace and our, and how do their how does our technology allow them to respond? And I'm going to start with Kathy because uh, Kathy comes from uh, the mortgage industry, and there's a pure example there where, boy, you, you've had free money for a long, long oh, time. Oh, not and not a long, and, long uh, time, and not nearly long enough. Um, so you know, I uh, in kind of getting ready for today, I took the opportunity um, to go back, and at the end of 2019. Um, Freddie Mac was forecasting for 2020 a market size of $2 trillion. This is in the mortgage space. And for 2021, the forecast was $1.9 trillion. Actual 2020, this is at the end of 2019, came in at $4.4 trillion. So substantially different. And then uh, 2021 came in at $4.8 trillion. And so if we're sitting at the end of 2019 and going into our budgeting process, having fixed and variable costs, right? And we're predicting and staffing using capacity models that Helen's talking about, kind of old school way, we're staffing up for what we think our part of a $2 trillion market is gonna be. And then we're thinking, oh, okay, well, 2021, it'll, you know, generally speaking, kind of flat, right? And maybe we can squeeze out some market share to make that work. Preparing the organization for a $4.4 trillion market was an entirely different exercise. And just to be clear, the pandemic, everybody got sent home in March at some point in time, right? In March. Um, and so, a lot of that growth really came in the second half of that year. Um, here's what I would tell you is, uh, you know, from a finance transformation perspective, agility being key, we were dealing at the same time with concerns about borrower delinquencies and the potential that we could see an unprecedented rise in our need for financing capacity for borrowers who were delinquent and we had to advance money to investors on their behalf. There were concerns, if I put myself back there, um, that certainly non-bank mortgage originators and servicers would not have the capacity to be able to finance all of that. Um, so that's one hand. On the other hand was one of the most favorable origination and in particular refi markets that had ever been seen, right? And now, and you know, mortgage rates 
got down to where I personally refinanced twice within 12 months. And many of the people on this call, if you're savvy at all, had an opportunity to do a similar thing. So if I think about agility, that's where you have to be thinking not just about your two standard deviation event, market events, you have to also be thinking somewhat about your tail events and also thinking about what does it cost me to be under capacitized? I'll use that word, feels like something mm -hmm. from back to the future, but under capacitized versus what does it cost me to be over capacitized? And this is where all that external data coming in is super helpful because the reality is, is the accordion effect on an organization to be able to double or even triple or take advantage of that kind of opportunity is very complicated because what you don't realize is you're doing that at the same time every other organization in your sector is doing mm -hmm. that. Um, so I think that agility really comes from having that insight that Helen's talking about using and knowing what's really going to drive your organization, which is what Juliet was mentioning, and having your, not just your technology, but your talent and your insights and your information that you're sharing be representative of a variety of different outcomes. Um, because I'm telling you, uh, like mortgage rates on any given day, uh, we have the flexibility to reprice instantaneously. But the farther away from that side of the market face that you get, the less kind of agility organizations typically have, right? So by the time you get to your accountants, you're kind of like plodding along a month in arrears. Um, and so mm -hmm. really it's how do you get to more of what I call a, a continuous close, um, which is there is no thing like this old world of once a month. Um, that may happen, but that's for reporting. It's That's a compliance function. The rest is really driving right, the business. Right. So I think that's where, you know, the agility comes in is just the ability to pivot and to be able to support and to also be anticipating um, a lot of different outcomes and providing that insight. So what role did your technology play in your ability to do that kind of pivoting? You, you mentioned the flux capacitor earlier. Was that yeah. what you guys used? Um, okay. We, you know, and this is where having sort of your people and your financial data all in one or the ability to bring it into one place is really super helpful. And I'm going to add mm -hmm. to that your the accordion side is generally speaking uh, your non employee base. And so if you have um, mm -hmm. contract resources, I guess I'll call it we those can be people or they can be services, right, where we call it you pay by the drink. Um, and so having mm -hmm. your contract resource capacity your employee resource capacity uh, and your financials all in a place to be able to then have data scientists and others who can model your needs, your variable costs, what that impact is, all of that. Um, that's what was able for us with transformation was to have all of that data in one place right to be able to leverage that so if interest rates jump which they do have been you're able to directly see the impact on staffing and how you hire and or how you well and we'll have capacity. um clearance into uh which levers we can pull what the timing of those levers are uh and that could be the ability to scale back on outsourced resources with 30 days notice. It could be with 10 days notice. It could be with 90 days notice. Um, and so having all of that in a, a combined place helps you kind of solve the Rubik's cube, right? Yep. So, you know, so Kathy was talking about transformation and you're on the other side of it. You're seeing the benefits now that you've implemented uh, software and and other technologies to to make this accordion work. Uh, I want to turn it back to, to Helen for a second. When we talk about finance transformation, I know 
uh, Tigon has a view to this. They've got a model that they they talk to clients about. Why don't you talk to us about how you guys look at sure. transformation? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I love Diamond. That's why I give the name as four C's here, right? The four C's here for finance team is the culture, the cybersecurity, the team, the competency and communication. Right. The first one is the culture. We have to finance team needs to shift this culture from tracking value to creating value. What that means is that from being transactional to being strategic and proactive. Uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, it's obvious our finance team actually plays integral role. They need to protect the financial data. Not only that, ensure compliance with regulatory requirements, especially if you have a global presence. Uh, the regular regulatory requirement might be different, depends on the country you're in, the region you're in. The third one is competency. When we talk about uh, team, the talent, it's so critical to develop competencies beyond the finance and, and accounting to better understand business needs, right? For example, if you work, you support a sales organization, you got to know the key drivers for their performance, what ARR is, what AVP is. You work as marketing team, you gotta know SQL, MQL, you know, how, what are the conversion rate? You gotta know all those metrics, what that means, how, what data, right, is relevant to them. And lastly, is most important is communication, the storytelling capability. Finance team needs to be able to explain, right? I think Julia talked about this, Kathy does did too. The finance team needs to be able to explain the context of the data to different stakeholders and guide them adapt to the scenario planning process or adapt to the changing uh, uncertain market. Telling the story of the data is more important than showing the data in the report. And that, I love that that term, I've always liked it because I'm more of a right brain thinker. Storytelling is putting context but behind the, the data and the numbers, right? That's, you know, when I think about chat GPT mm -hmm. and other emerging technologies that are going right. to help write, you know, I would say delegate down more lower value added parts of, of, the, of the easy stuff. Revenues went up, expenses went down, you know, here's why the profit, but really telling the story of what actually happened in the marketplace. It's very difficult for CFOs who are caught in the, the plan, execute, analyze monthly cycle, and they're, they're catching up and reporting. And then there's very little time for them to go back to the why and get into what really happened and, and, and tell that story because they're just trying to accumulate the numbers, put them together. Um, thinking about storytelling, like when you talk to your board, right? So how do you, leverage storytelling to explain the results of your operations like how you're doing too when you talk to say your board of directors and I'll, I'll i'll just ask you that helen when you when you're doing having to tell the story what happened what how do you leverage your technology to do that yeah it's uh when, when we communicate with the board we have to be mindful about the board of directors role they're you know they're more of like uh nose in hands out type of role they're not your know, operating executive so you have to start from a higher level or tell the story meaning that you don't go in to say here is the data for a monthly forecast but you talk about hey by the way our sales performance has gone up but here is the total picture projection of our sales performance in the next uh you know year but here is it key drivers, right, within the, you know, the, what does that mean? And how did we try, really came up with that uh, projection? And what is your, our confidence level in the next uh, thing? And then if there is a merger acquisition, sales or growth, organic growth versus, um, um, versus traditional growth, then you should talk about growth drivers, right? And then cutting, like, for example, cost reductions, another uh, area or operational efficiency is another thing that board cares about, right? What are the four or five things that's relevant for board to be uh, to be uh, uh, aware? And then most importantly, when I talk to work with the board, I find that you you shouldn't be just leverage the board as a reporting and the time to report the data. It should be you know really discuss the strategic decision you got to make. Right. Is there a way when you grow, I'm, you know, I'm interested in acquiring a company. Is that right timing to uh, really consider this merger acquisition? And think about yeah. if we're cutting the cost and what are the other um, 
what other the factors that could contribute to that cost reduction or, or productivity improvement? Those should be a strategic decision rather than just say, I'm going to show you the monthly reporting. You should just really communicate those data to them ahead of the board meeting, but leverage board meeting to really come up with more strategic decisions rather than just reporting. But I've been to so many board meetings, purely just reporting. Uh, it really defeats the purpose of the board meeting, but there are also great boards where they do come up with effective strategic decision yeah. working together. What's really happening in the market? Not just what the numbers tell you, but what do we think? What are the insights that's really happening to tell that story? You mentioned M&A, you mentioned growth and boards. I, I want to flip this back to, you know, we, we talk about adaptability of systems. One of the biggest challenges when I was a CFO was M&A can just completely distract and disrupt what you're doing as a, as, a, as a company, all of a sudden you've inherited a new division, or in some cases you bought a company that may have bigger, more revenues than you do. m and is a hot topic because it, it almost always leads to rethinking data and systems and having to integrate two different companies that are on different software. I, I'd love to turn this over to Kathy and just have you talk to us a little bit. Yeah. You're smiling, but kind of your journey with m and and how technology has enabled uh, your well, success, three though. general ledger uh, HR implementations in 20 months, um, two of which were driven by M&A uh, is certainly why I had a little bit of a smile on my face. Um, look, I think, again, it's we anticipated when we did our first implementation um, that there would be follow on M&A that would occur. And so, again, this is where you have to be super strategic. And it doesn't mean you're always 100% right, but we thought about that as part of the implementation. We thought about it as part of um, our decision, for example, around segments. And we thought about it as the ways that we wanted to capture data, meaning would we want to be able to see the performance of certain acquisitions even though they might no longer be separated in a particular segment or legal entity right like are you going to want to be able to track that particular acquisition over time um, you make room for it if that's the right word within your chart of accounts or within what you're anticipating um, and so what you also do is you have to have and build kind of your little program and you just have to march through that checklist, right? And you do, unfortunately, or fortunately, revisit each time, which is appropriate because, you know, we had two HR systems, we had two GLs, uh, we have Tableau versus, uh, you know, whatever other report, you have, you have, I call it Noah's Ark, you have two of everything. Um, and so obviously each, owner of those different you know sort of uh swim lanes i guess that way or this way um you know there are going to be decisions that are going to be made but again having the right technology partner anticipating that that's the kind of direction or kind of organization that you're going to be is super important um because that gives you that agility and the adaptability so we were able to slot these in um relatively easily and pretty cost effectively to the point now where um, we think we have the internal resources that subsequent depending on how big they are but subsequent m a uh, we think we could absorb them in without the big disruption that you sometimes get uh, from these types of things but just know that every m a is a chance to rethink how you do everything um, but you can't boil the ocean you know what I mean? You just, if you get lost, boil in the Absolutely. ocean, then nothing comes back out. Um, but you also don't want bad well, that's data. A, that's a you don't point. want bad yeah. data. So you have to be thoughtful. Yeah. I, I like I like your point about using it, leveraging it as an opportunity to rethink uh, in, in your transformation. Um, I'm gonna flip this over to Juliet though, because I, I, I know you've got a view around transformation and and not waiting until a significant emotional event, we used to call it in consulting, a significant emotional event comes to, to rethink things. You, 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 your view is more, how do you continuously think about transformation? So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Juliet? 
Yeah, and I'm so glad you used the word continuous. I feel like that's come up a couple of times, like earlier your point, Kathy, about like continuous close and, and thinking about like rolling forecasts and everything is now so real time, right? But that's the, the case for change and transformation too. You know, maybe 10 years ago, we were talking about, okay, we're going through a finance transformation. And then what happens at the end of the transformation, right? That, that There's no end to the transformation these days. Like our world is moving faster and faster, right? And so, what we find is is really there needs to be a rethink and many organizations are rethinking this concept of transformation as being not a one time event, but a continuous event and moving towards like I'll call it a learning organization that is continuously getting better. Right, because as you rethink some of your technology and your data and your processes and make them much more interconnected in the ways that we, we discussed in terms of driving new insight. There's always the next thing, right? Like, how do I get faster at it? How do I make decisions better? How do I engage different people in the business in a different way, in a more agile and cross-functional way to make decisions? You know, like even think about, you mentioned chat GPT earlier, right? Like that was not a thing we were talking about six, 12 months ago. And now right. I've, I've seen some, some really interesting things where you know, someone can go into a data set, this is very experimental, but go into a data set and ask like, well, what happened to my, my revenues with this product? Ask the data set that, and then it puts up a chart with an explanation, right? Now that's just a start, right? That's very experimental, but think about the next, next step of that. And what's the next new technology that's coming online that's gonna fundamentally change how we interact with data, how we make decisions. So, you know, I really think of it more as change is not just an event, it's a capability. And it becomes so important to enable and equip finance leaders with that comfort to drive continuous change and really rethink their role and how they do work and how they provide value to the business. Yeah, and I, I do want to double click on the change management in, in just a second when we talk about talent. Uh, thank you for that, Juliet. There's a question that's come in in the chat. And I want to encourage our audience members, please get your questions in there. We hope to leave some time at the end to answer your questions. Before we move on to the talent topic, the one question that's come in is, what's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in trying to move their financial management out of Excel? How did they get past it? Uh, uh, Kathy, or any of you want to take a shot at that one? I have my own views to it. I, uh... The fact that they're getting out of the cell is a good, is a good starting point. Yeah, right? I, uh, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, uh, pivot tables and V lookups, thou shalt not. It's like my 10 commandments. Um, one of the biggest challenges of moving out, to be honest, is, uh, and we're going to get to talent and talk about it separately, but is people, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in a lot of the newer tools, you don't, actually, if you're doing a consolidation, and this is very simple, you don't actually see the consolidating entries. Um, that makes people uncomfortably nervous because they can't see it. And if they can't see it, it must not happen. Um, same thing with foreign currency translations mm -hmm. and things like that. Technology is to the point where journal entries or things that people could download or put in Excel or pivot or calculate or VLOOKUP or whatever. Um, so the biggest challenge is your people and their skill sets and their comfort level with change. And that, yeah. from my perspective, was always the biggest challenge is that there's just a natural what 90 percent of the people are just really change averse uh, or a substantial percentage um and so i think that's one of the hardest things and when we're talking about making a leap from excel into reliance on a dashboard or a a, a widget that's on your screen to give you filtered information to try to drive you toward things that are exceptions as opposed to transactions. I, I don't remember if it was Juliet or Helen that said it's not about transactions anymore. It's about exceptions and that people mm -hmm. like to touch things. And so I think that would be what I would observe. But I don't know, Scott, Juliet, Helen, 
No, you're, you're, you're I, I, you know, I would chime in. Go ahead, Helen. A client of mine is a CFO at a global plastic molding company, right? They have business in 13 plus countries, just one through acquisition. So each country has a local controller, right? The CFO has to really rely on the local controller to report the data in Excel uh, to show them what's happening in the uncertain market. And, and I asked him, what is your biggest pain point? He said, automating that whole process. Obviously it takes time. You have to show people, here's how you do it today. Once it's in the system, you know, you still have the data, but you, the ability to take that data out of the system to show them, right, they still have the data, give them a comfort level, that takes time. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, so that's being said, you know, it's easier to be said than done, right? The psychological impact on people when it comes to change management, we cannot ignore. Okay, before we move on to our, our topic of, of, of get, diving into the people side, one last poll question, and it's this, what force is having the greatest impact on your finance organization? Evolving stakeholder expectations, continued market risk and volatility, digital transformation, changing skills and talent needs, regulatory change, and geopolitical risk. And I'm gonna give folks a second to answer this. Um, while they're doing that, we will move on to our last topic, which is talent. We've already kind of a, a, a touched on it, um, you know, when we think about, and there's another question that's come in around, you know, how do we attract and retain the next generation of finance professionals? Um, I say this all the time because it's just it's mind blowing to me. I have kids coming out of coming out of college now. The average graduate coming out of school today was five years old when the iPhone came out. Just think about that. They've had the world at their fingertips as far as they know, that's how it always works. It's just, I just put it in here and I get the answer. And then you're gonna come work for a company that's got outdated technology that was probably implemented in the nineties uh, that requires lookups and code changes and all, all this sort of thing. Um, the question is how do we attract and retain people in finance? And I'm gonna start this conversation with saying, you gotta do something with your technology, but you also have to talk about your people strategy. Our controller at Workday says, my people strategy is my technology strategy. They're embedded, they're so so linked together because it's how she recruits and keeps people is the technology underlying that, that gives them opportunities to constantly upskill, to be refreshing their skills, to learn new things. With Workday, for example, every six months, a new version comes out, you get trained on it. So it is about training. You're retraining people to think outside of the Excel box, for example, you're training them in a whole new way of doing things which is, which is much more strategic and value add, but it means letting go of things that might have filled your day before that you could have done with limited you know, uh, brain power. Now you got to kind of go up the cycle. So we're talking about a pretty dramatic change here. And, and I'd like to kind of throw it over to you, Juliet, because um, I know you have a view to change management. It's always to me been as a CFO, honestly, a little bit of a black box at, you know, when you buy, when you buy an implementation from a service provider or an integrator or a software company, you know, change management, it, it's just, it feels kind of murky and, and dark, right? It's, it's not a science, it's more of an art. So tell us kind of your perspective from BCG on how you look at change management when we're thinking about talent. Yeah, so a couple things. First, I want to double down on your your point earlier around the next generation. Um, just to share a quick story, I was um, in a meeting with the CFO of a global healthcare company, and we were talking specifically about talent. And he said, "We hire the best of the brightest, and then they come here and they're doing manual reconciliation in Excel, and they don't want to do that, right?" And so there really is something about offering tools and technology that is critical to attracting and retaining that younger talent. Um, and then to that point, I would say, you know, we have some research that shows that the next generation, more than any other generation, cares about purpose. And purpose is defined many ways, but I think within a business context, that's very much connected to what's the impact of my work. And so I think for the younger generation, very clearly tying the work they're doing to business impact and empowering them to engage in that and to see the impact of their work becomes so important. Um, and so with that, then, when I think about change management, we think about it from two lenses. There's the hard side of change and the soft side of change. And I think where companies go wrong too often is they lean just into the soft side of change. I think it's important, right? No doubt. But they start with the hearts and minds. Now, again, hearts and minds is important. Communication is critically important. 
but people are also rational beings and they're going to engage in a way that's rational based on the organizational context that they work in, right? So what I've seen time and time again is we implement a new tool, but the person doesn't wanna engage in the tool, they keep wanting to go in Excel, right? And there is a reason that they're continuing to go into Excel. And so when I think about the hard side of change, there is something about incentives and enablers, right? So in incentives, how are we rewarding people? You know, when they look around and see who's successful around me, are there, are there people who have, are successful that are engaged in the new way of working and using the tools? If the manager above them is still asking for that old version of Excel, you better believe they're gonna stay in Excel, right? And then there's the enablers, right? So what training and coaching are we giving to people? Um, all of these sorts of things so that it's not just about will, like incentives, but skill. Like, are you giving them the right skills? And so I think the right change management approach in any transformation takes all of these elements together, the communication plan, how it connects to performance management, how it connects to learning and development, how this connects to what you're seeing your managers do, who do we promote? Who do we celebrate? You have to have all of those things and be very thoughtful about it over time and reinforcing those. Otherwise, the technology and the new ways of working are not going to be adopted. We, in, I've been in consulting or around it for 30 something years. And I, back when I started my career in the, I'm not going to say when, um, we had this idea of the triangle, right? Which at the top of the triangle was insights, sort of your FP&A, the middle was controls and reporting and statutory reporting. And the bottom was all the transactional layer. And, and we used to say that one day that triangle is going to move like this. Well, that's already happened. So it's finally gone to where if you look at what companies are hiring for, it's about a third in the top, third in the middle, third at the transactional layer. But we did a, a study at PwC. We found out that the the FANG companies, the big, the big tech companies, which we often look to as sort of the pioneers of the future, they've actually inverted the triangle. Most of their hires are in that 50% or so are in that insights side of the business uh, and very few transactional because they're removing that. And I want to, I want to pump this question over to Kathy because Kathy has a very simple to understand four point process she goes through when she thinks about making the jobs easier for her team. Yeah, so that, I Kathy. start with stop doing it. Um, <clears throat> Do we have to do it? Um, the next thing I say is if we have to do it, then let's automate it. And I say, okay, if we have to do it and we can't automate it, then let's outsource it. And if we can't do any of those th three things, then you just immediately go back to the top and rethink whether you really need to do it um, or not. Um, you know, uh, and sometimes you got to go through that cycle a couple of times, right? To really kind of press people to think hard about, do we have to do it, uh, is always my first filter. And then the second is automate it. I mean, I actually started thinking, and uh, Juliet, you're being kind, six months uh, to 12 months ago with chat, you know, uh, whatever, GPT and all that stuff. I have... Um, I was actually thinking about that this morning. I'm like, oh, I think I could use that to draft financial statements. Like I'm actually gonna, I think, go in and just say, yeah. okay, go off, look at all these other ones and come back and give me a draft of financial statements. Um, you know, there's obviously it's not gonna replace, well, not obviously, I guess immediately it won't replace, um, but what an interesting concept uh, to actually be able to leverage technology. And I have a simple other rule, which is if I can spend $80 on Quicken and do it on my personal PC, mm. then for sure there's technology out there that can do this. So count reconciliations in Excel, please, things download into right. Quicken and get wrecked automatically, you know? Uh, and so all of this can be done at our level, um, but you've got to have, kind of your filters and you got to stick with them. Well, can you believe it? We're almost at time. We've only got a few seconds left. There's a last question in here I'll pose to think about. We may not be able to get it answered, but how do we think the finance field is going to evolve over the next couple of years? I think we've already touched on it. More of the insights, more leveraging technology like chat GPT, Workday, Adaptive, et cetera. 
those technologies that can take the menial tasks out and give people more purpose back to Helen's point. So you can have more purpose if you're doing more strategic things. If you're really looking at the business drivers, the storytelling, we talked about all of that. Um, I want to thank all three of you so much for your time today. This has been a great conversation. As I said, we could probably do this for several hours, but we are at time. And thank you to all of our audience members who participated. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up after this. And thank you all again, and have a great rest of your workday. Thank you, panel, for that excellent discussion. And thanks, everyone in the audience, for joining us for this webinar. And enjoy the rest of your day.